All right, hi everybody. We'll give it another minute or two. I see people are filing in. We'll get started shortly. Okay, so hi everybody and good afternoon. Thank you everybody for uh, uh, coming in and attending uh, this RCP webinar. Uh, today we're going to talk about computer vision project management in the age of AI. Uh, and we uh, hope and uh, to share some of our knowledge on how uh, we go about managing these projects and share some of these tips uh, with you. Uh, my name is Moshe Safran. I'm the uh, head of our US activities and I'll be hosting today Eagle Schenkman, uh, experienced AI technician. Uh, from our company. Hi, Igal. How are you doing? Hi. A pleasure to be here. <laughs> great. Same here. Yeah, great talking to you. Uh, so before we get started, uh, just a few words about our company. Uh, many of you probably know us already and are familiar. Uh, we're a solutions provider. Uh, we are in the business of creating AI and computer vision uh, modules for medical as well as general purpose applications. Uh, we do customized development for project needs, and our solutions are uh, part of medical devices as well as uh, uh, other solutions that are deployed in industrial and agricultural pr production situations. We have a pretty big team of engineers. We've been around for a long time. Uh, we uh, provide a sort of a full stack uh, AI computer vision solutions, uh, R&D, as well as uh, annotation uh, and uh, domain experts uh, for medical projects as well. Uh, and uh, because uh, this is our focus on, uh, on this, uh, and this uh, domain expertise, uh, we can apply this technology to many uh, different applications uh, from medical applications such as orthopedics, vis video analysis, surgical navigation, and more uh, to agricultural applications, uh, automotive adjacent applications such as in-car computer vision uh, and uh, uh, sensor data processing, uh, inspection, quality control for industry, uh, many more applications. There are uh, many uh, uh, interrelated uh, commonalities uh, between uh, these tasks from our point of view as uh, computer vision uh, engineers, uh, even though the use cases can be uh, very varied and very widespread. Uh, we also do some academic collaborations uh, with universities and hospitals. Uh, just as an aside, we keep, try to keep uh, uh, the flame going uh, there as well and occasionally uh, uh, get some of our work published when it's possible. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Yigal. Yigal is uh, one of our uh, strongest and uh, most experienced uh, AI uh, tech leads. Uh, he's led uh, multiple projects in computer vision from video analysis in industrial and medical applications, uh, pose estimation, a lot of medical image segmentation, uh, diagnosis uh, 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 in a, a research uh, setting uh, for medical applications. Uh, and has led teams uh, in tackling various algorithmic challenges, uh, uh, accuracy challenges, as well as software and uh, efficiency challenges. So I'm very happy to be hosting Eagle today. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, structuring an AI project. Uh, afterwards, a lot about uh, making it work, quality management uh, and failure analysis. So how to take AI, AI solutions uh, from a nice work or from the hype you see in the press or from a proof of concept, how to take that all the way to a uh, system that can actually be used in a real life setting uh, where you need much higher quality and you also need uh, uh, sometimes to address uh, challenges in terms of running time, uh, which would be uh, the third topic, making it work fast. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up with a few sort of general project management tips and uh, towards the end, uh, open it up to your questions. 
So, uh, Yigal, uh, looking very forward uh, to hearing what you have to say. Uh, and the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so, uh, the way that I, your usual uh, AI project will go, you'll start with uh, some proof of concept, uh, just to see that the problem that you're so trying to solve is uh, indeed solvable. Uh, you're going to do it on a smaller scale, uh, or maybe just a partial solution just to get you going. Then you're going to move ahead to the cycle, the production cycle, which means uh, collect more data, annotate more data, update your algorithm, fine tuning, fine, fine tune it, uh, go, uh, go and see where it fails. And when you've understood where the algorithm fails, you might need to, under to uh, collect more data to go over your annotations. And the cycle goes on and on until you are satisfied. And then you will uh, evaluate on the test set, which is a data set that the algorithm has never seen, just to see how your algorithm actually behaves. And you also uh, want to deploy it, but we'll uh, talk more about that later. Uh, so uh, how, the first part, how do we make it work? How do we uh, get from the task to the algorithmic solution? So the first step is, uh, as uh, we said, proof of concept, uh, just a few hundreds of images, maybe some videos, if that's your test. Uh, we do it with, uh, and we do the annotations with the internal annotation team, which makes it uh, easy to keep it uh, in a tight loop, uh, fixing uh, the annotations or annotating uh, some uh, else, some uh, in some other method. Uh, Usually, if the task is uh, straightforward and uh, encapsulated, uh, it will take two to three months until we get these initial results. And of course, we want to evaluate it on uh, some appropriate metric uh, for a classification test. You want to try the F1 or accuracy. For segmentation, we we'll probably want to do dice. Uh, of course, you'll have to pick the appropriate metric for your task. Uh, then we move on to the production phase, which is this cycle. Uh, you're going to collect uh, many more images. Uh, and the way we annotate them, uh, we keep uh, using our in-house team, but we also might use uh, some external assistance, uh, maybe for multiple sites, maybe with crowdsource. Uh, we do the quality control in-house. Uh, we go over uh, the annotations ourselves uh, with our annotation team, with our experts. And we also use uh, the algorithm itself to do some quality control, even though the algorithm that we have at this point immediately after uh, the POC uh, is only partial or only or not that accurate, uh, but it still can help us identify some problems in the annotation set. We'll see that soon. Uh, on projects that need, uh, that, that, that need uh, this type of uh, validation set uh, where the data is uh, sometimes ambiguous, uh, we usually build uh, a validation set with uh, majority voting. That means that each image is annotated by more than one annotator and the majority uh, majority vote besides the annotation. And we do all this, uh, all of these uh, steps uh, iteratively uh, again and again and again until we, uh, with a combination of failure analysis, uh, until we get to, uh, to satisfactory results. Uh, so this is an example of uh, uh, one of the ways we do some quality control. Uh, we use the algorithm itself to uh, identify problems in the annotation sets. So here on the top, you can see the prediction of the network and its confidence of when the game is on. And on the bottom, you see the ground truth. So you, you could see that uh, they agreed on uh, up until now. And now the network says that the game is on when the annotation set is off. So we actually use the uh, algorithm to identify a problem in the annotation set. Let's see that again. So now they agree. Now they agree and... So the algorithm knows the game is on and the annotator missed it. Maybe somebody got bored. It happens. It happens, yeah. Uh, another thing that uh, I would uh, always want to do when you're writing code is uh, to identify uh, the bugs. Uh, usually in uh, deep learning frameworks, uh, in deep learning projects, there are less lines of code compared to uh, your usual software. Uh, but that that uh, means that it's less uh, 
less options for bugs to happen, less uh, debugging to do, but always a good idea to do. Uh, another issue is that uh, for well, this is uh, look at this example. Uh, we have uh, some task that uh, uh, tries to identify the seats in the car that are taken. So in the PMC, you might have just used uh, your usual uh, CNN convolutional neural network, and uh, and then you identify some problems uh, when moving on because sometimes. Uh, uh, let's say someone crouches behind the driver's seat and the network that uh, is used to get only one frame uh, misidentifies this as uh, non, not occupied. So, of course, you now we have to use some uh, time series tool. And you might think that you want to use an LSTM, uh, but that would require tons more training data because you have to have people crouching behind uh, seats, moving between seats, getting out and in the car, you will need to get a lot more training data, which is also expensive. So you might want to consider at this point not to use an LSTM and maybe uh, go back to some uh, classical statistical tools, uh, let's say common filter. Uh, so you have to pick the right tools for the job. Uh, another thing that you might want to take a look at, uh, of course, hyperparameters. Uh, for instance, patch size. Uh, so on the image on the right uh, top, uh, you see some different uh, patch uh, size options. And uh, you, would, of course, wouldn't want to pick the smallest one because then you, could, you couldn't even see yourself what, what, what is the object in the patch size. But you all also don't, won't want to see some big patch because, uh, well, for two reasons, actually. One of them is that uh, the training, the training uh, time would take much longer. And the other uh, reason is that you uh, insert into the patch lots of noise, lots of data that uh, shouldn't, that isn't of interest to your test. Uh, so you have to pick them, uh, the patch size wisely. And the general rule of, rule of thumb here is take a look yourself at the patch. If you can see, uh, if you can identify what you want to identify, what you want the network to identify, then you're on the good track. Uh, natural, uh, neural networks were modeled on biological vision systems. If you can see it in the image, then the network will have an easy time too. Uh, another option, uh, sometimes you would have uh, to use, you would have uh, imbalanced data. So for, uh, for instance, in this uh, type of data where you, you want to do uh, teeth segmentation, uh, most of the data set might contain a uh, full, full set of teeth, and uh, the network might be confused when it gets only a partial set of teeth. So an easy way to deal with that is just uh, use, uh, let's call it tooth dropout, just uh, randomly select and remove from the image uh, some of the teeth that will uh, require the network to learn uh, what happens when some of the teeth are missing as well. So, so th there, there's what? How many different combinations of missing teeth can there be for for a patient? Do you really need to artificially generate each and every uh, possible example if you're starting to artificially generate data? What what would the general rule of thumb for that be? Uh, well, the total possible number is indeed exponential, which is a lot. Uh, but the way I would have done it is uh, maybe randomly drop out three, four, five teeth uh, from each each image, and of course keep keep some of uh, the full uh, images intact, and um, go back to the cycle, retrain the algorithm, see if the uh, see if the confusion disappeared or if other changes might uh, uh, are uh, needed. Uh, but it, I wouldn't I wouldn't do all the possible combinations. It's too much, too much training data is also uh hazardous i uh, just uh, go with a few teeth uh, and see what happens uh, another option uh sometimes that uh the network might get confused with uh, other data uh, that uh, looks similar to the one the data that you're looking for for instance here we have uh not long module segmentation so we, the three images here are uh, of long nodules and uh the network might confuse uh, might get confused with the image on the right, which doesn't show a long nodule, but water. And uh, one way to solve this was to, uh, will be just to annotate these water images as another class. As, so instead of 
the nodal classes, you now have nodal class and a water class, and uh, the network will start to identify also water in addition to all the nodal classes. Uh, other problems that uh, will crop up once in a while, uh, some technical issues. Uh, so, for example, these two images were resized from the same source image, uh, but they look quite different. And the reason is they, that they were uh, resized from uh, with uh, different libraries. So, although they're both with uh, linear interpolation, they look quite different. So uh, every once in a while, we're gonna run into some technical details like this. Uh, you wanna keep it in mind. Mm -hmm. What about like video compression? If, if one trains a neural network on one type of uh, image or video compression, is it going to be uh, sensitive to that? Uh, how, how do you deal with that typically? Uh, in my experience, uh, it doesn't uh, affect uh, network uh, accuracy that much, but if you're suspecting that this could be the culprit of uh, your inaccuracies, so first test it and see that you're actually, uh, you actually identified the problem. And then it's quite simple to just, uh, for example, add uh, JPEG uh, artifacts augmentation. There are plenty of uh, libraries who will do that uh, happily for you. And yeah, then so the network can learn to ignore them. Yeah, that's that's like the the quote unquote magic of AI. That if if you come come across a, a difficult case or a problem, usually what you need to do is show the network during training the proper examples, and and you can fix it. You don't need to come up with a, yes, exactly. a, whole, exactly. a whole new formula or a whole new explicit algorithm. It's, it's more data driven. Okay, so we talked about how to take. Uh the task, the idea, and get it to uh, an accurate algorithm, uh, but sometimes you would also want to make it run fast. Uh, so, for example, uh, here on the right, uh, you, you can see post estimation. Uh, with, so, the, the state of the art in post estimation, uh, let's say your open post runs heavily, so you might want to train, so you might want to have some uh, other uh, other options or other techniques to make it run faster. Uh, so we're gonna see uh, three ways, three main ways that we work to make things run faster. Uh, because, well, sometimes you don't have a strong uh, PC with the GPU, you have some uh, lower power, uh, lower cost uh, hardware, such as the NVIDIA Jetson or some edge compute. Uh, so we're gonna talk about moving from Python to C++. Uh, some code optimization, some network speed up. Okay, so just a few words uh, for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, Python is a high level interpreted language. It's a, it has a very terse syntax. It's easy to develop in and it's easy to experiment in. So most of your uh, production cycle, uh, well, we choose to use Python. Uh, problem is it's quite slow, uh, for example, uh, in Python, every line of code needs to get translated into machine code at running time, uh, as opposed to C++, which, it, which is compiled uh, ahead of time uh, and runs much faster. I'm not going to go into a lot of details here, but uh, generally there are languages that are used to uh, develop your ideas and experiment and languages that are used for production. So we move from Python to C++. What, what, what's the typical impact of this phase, like on, on the timeline of a project? Uh, in, in which cases this is going to have a significant impact, or, or, or is it relatively straightforward? If, if we want to sort of plan ahead and understand what, what, we're, what we're expecting down the road. So uh, usually uh, you don't have to translate all your code from Python to C++. You will really want to translate only, only the inference part. Uh, not, you don't have to uh, perform experiments in C++, only predictions. Uh, so that's a rather small subset of our uh, of a typical uh, AI project. So it doesn't take that much time, uh, but it, the gains are significant. Uh, you can save a lot of running time. The program is going to be much, much quicker. So this is a first step that you're going to do. Uh, wholeheartedly recommend. Uh, code optimization. So uh, if you take anything from this slide, it's this. Uh, you don't know where your code is uh, running slow, so you need to profile and then optimize and then profile again and then optimize and profile again. 
And these uh, small gains actually add up uh, because if you, for instance, uh, can cut 3% of your running time, but do it 50 times, perform 50 different optimization that, optimizations that each, each, of, each one save 3%, then you're going to save almost 80% running time. And if you do that for 100 iterations, you're going to save 95% of your running times. Uh, significant. Many, many of your speed, uh, speed ups will come through specializations, uh, which means that if you have, let's say, some, uh, of some generic function to multiply matrices, uh, but all your matrices, if you find, find out after some experimentation, after some digging in, that uh, all your matrices are quite small. So maybe it would be wise to take all of these small matrix multiplications and write some highly optimized function that will perform multiplications only on these metric matrices. And actually this, uh, this idea has led up uh, to significant speed ups in past, past project, projects. So most of these gains, most of the gains, most of the, uh, most of the time we're gonna save is gonna come through these specializations. Uh, other improvements uh, through uh, algorithms or through uh, data search structure changes, uh, really, you'll have to just profile and see uh, where you can uh, improve. Yeah, another question here, Yigal, like, again, more, more from the sort of project management perspective. So how do we know when we're done here or or what, what's what's the expected uh, uh, trade-off? Like, how, how do you know when to continue uh, focusing on, on on the aspect of the code that you've been uh, optimizing at some given point of time? And how do we know when we're starting to uh, experience diminishing returns? So uh, actually, yeah, that's correct. Uh, most of the large gains you're going to get uh, at the beginning of the profile, at the beginning of the optimization uh, session, uh, the lowest hanging fruits uh, will give you the, the best uh, improvements. And in time, you'll see less and less improvement. So you can continue to focus on, uh, on this if you think that you can uh, improve the running time, but there are other options as well. Uh, for instance, uh, network speed ups. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's kind of almost a counterintuitive. It's kind of a, a inverse relation between the effort and the and the benefit, uh, because the earliest efforts uh, that might be easier actually it can be uh, much more beneficial. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you uh, decide that you want to uh, stop focusing on these uh, diminishing returns, there are other options, uh, all under active research, but still can. Uh, improve your running times uh, significantly. These are changes to the neural network itself. So uh, for example, we have a quantization, which means uh, lowering the precision of each weight. Uh, let, for instance, instead of floating point uh, with 32 bits, uh, change it to an integer with uh, eight bits, uh, just an example. Or uh, another option is just use a smaller network. Uh, you'd be surprised that uh, a significantly smaller network can perform quite as well, uh, quite, quite good as well. There are other, uh, all sorts of tricks, uh, that's why separate convolutions or Cirello or also pruning. I'm not gonna go into all the technical details, but all of these are uh, can help you reduce running times quite a bit and uh, not necessarily with uh, uh, causing uh, your accuracy to be worse. Uh, you'll I have to try and see as, again with the cycle, uh, try these uh, options uh, and see how they affect your running times and accuracy. And uh, that's it for me. Thanks, Egan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to sort of uh, sum things up in a nutshell with a, four, a few more uh, general tips. Uh, so the first tip uh, is a review 100 images. Uh, it's all visual. So what do we mean by this? This has always been true in computer vision uh, for many years. Uh, even before uh, before AI, this was sort of obvious, right? Uh, uh, before the, the, the age of, uh, of AI, uh, the go-to in computer vision was uh, hard-coded, very specific solutions on how to analyze the image. So you look for edges uh, in one particular area of the image. You have thresholds, uh, 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 various handcrafted algorithms. Uh, in that era, it was clear why uh, visual analysis uh, was everything. Uh, but what we really find uh, uh, even today 
when we're training uh, systems to learn automatically how to solve these problems, uh, it is still uh, uh, no less important to have visual understanding of the problem. Don't stop at the initial stage with only a few representative examples. You cannot just throw your images into an AI uh, uh, system or into some generic platform and hope for a good result. You need the diligent review of a, a, a pretty large set of images uh, to understand uh, uh, the issues and to be able uh, to fix them, to be able to understand how to retrain your network, uh, which uh, artificial examples to generate for the next iteration of your training, uh, and also you need to involve domain experts uh, to understand really uh, what your metrics uh, for uh, success of the AI is going to be. Uh, the second tip is to have a multidisciplinary team. So uh, again, as, as, a, as a company, as a team that's been doing computer vision for many years, uh, this, this is uh, very true, uh, has always been very true uh, for the more classical and non-AI computer vision solutions. Uh, you need mathematical expertise, uh, it's eclectic, you borrow from math, from physics, from signal processing, uh, from statistics. Uh, even in machine learning and deep learning, there are many different disciplines. Uh, but today, uh, besides the uh, mathematical and the visual uh, intuition uh, that's still needed, uh, and of course, uh, the programming uh, expertise, that's uh, uh, very important for AI and machine learning. Uh, there are other disciplines that are no less important uh, to have on your AI development team. Uh, first of all, the domain experts, which we have uh, talked about a lot, but not only domain experts, but uh, also the people who are doing uh, the more day-to-day -day, uh, grunt work, so to speak, of creating the ground truth, of annotating the images. Uh, these are a very important uh, uh, part of your AI team. Uh, it's uh, very beneficial to have uh, close and tight communication with the annotation teams to be able to iterate quickly uh, different cycles of annotation uh, and R&D. Uh, not to just uh, have some uh, remote solution where you're uh, throwing uh, throwing your data at Mechanical Turk, Amazon Mechanical Turk, or some generic platform, and hoping for the best, and then trying to manage that quality, but really having uh, uh, more direct uh, uh, communication or even co-location uh, uh, physically, when hopefully that uh, uh, becomes possible again uh, of your teams, uh, that can uh, improve the time to market of uh, AI solutions uh, very significantly, as well as the quality. Uh, of, of the ground truth data and therefore the quality of the resulting algorithm. Uh, sorry for that. Tip number three, deep learning is not just a black box. This sort of uh, goes with uh, what uh, both of us have been saying uh, already. Uh, it uh, it uh, uh, comes to bear in many aspects of the problem, so there are many ways to implement uh, deep learning. Visual understanding is needed. Uh, and also you can split the problem into stages. So even in uh, like in fields like automotive, nobody's really trying to create one uh, one network uh, to uh, to win them all, so to speak. One huge neural network that's just getting the video feed and the sensors and is spitting out on the other end a steering wheel angle and a, a gas uh, brake level. Uh, uh, even in fields like that, which are uh, almost 100% uh, machine learning based, you still uh, split up the problem into modules. It's still quite helpful. Uh, to have your solution uh, be modular and be built of uh, explainable and understandable uh, modules. So in, in AI, uh, in automotive, it's, you know, there's one module that's for road lines, uh, lane detection, another one car detection. Uh, that makes it easier to debug the solution and also uh, creates more effective solutions uh, to still break the problem into pieces. Uh, tip uh, number four, and this is true of, uh, of software development in general, but it's all the more true of uh, algorithmic uh, development. Uh, so uh, in R&D, there are always uh, uh, risks and definitely in uh, computer vision solutions that you don't know ahead of time uh, how things are going to perform. You don't know ahead of time uh, necessarily the specific uh, technical challenges, uh, whether on the algorithmic side or on the data side that are going to come up. Uh, so you need to work uh, with a relatively small cycles and to iterate on this. Uh, uh, you should try to deliver some tangible result on a weekly basis even. Uh, sometimes that can be an updated version of the software. Sometimes that can be uh, just some uh, uh, explainable and understandable uh, visual result. But it's very uh, important uh, to have uh, uh, short cycles of iter iteration on the uh, solution uh, and reassessing the problem uh, constantly. Uh, which uh, in the end is uh, going to give you a good result. Uh, thank you. So that, that's, uh, that's sort of what we uh, wanted to share with you today. Uh, I'd like to open up the floor uh, for questions. Uh, so I see a few people are, uh, are writing things in. Uh, first question actually from uh, uh, 
uh, David. Uh, Yigal, I think this one's probably for you. Uh, so you, you talked a lot about domain experts and about having a, a professional uh, ground truth. So uh, what, what, what do you do uh, with the cost of this? So what, what happens if those domain experts are very expensive? What happens if their time is uh, not available? Uh, you're talking about thousands of images you need annotated in the data set. Uh, how, how does one deal with the, the scarcity of uh, domain expert uh, resources? Uh, so we deal with it uh, with two two options. Uh, one of them is having uh, the experts uh, train our annotation team. Uh, they also have to be in, in somewhat uh, tight loop, at least in the beginning. But then the uh, uh, the annotation team uh, will learn the task. And uh, for every problematic uh, example, we still rely on the experts and rely on the experts to uh, validate that what the annotators uh, have done was uh, correct. And uh, so that cuts uh, quite a lot of uh, the reliance of, uh, on, uh, on the experts. And another option is when we need the experts themselves to annotate, uh, we give them semi-automatic tools. So they're more classic computer vision, but they're still gonna cut uh, quite a lot of uh, the experts' time. Uh, so that leads to some uh, savings in these uh, expensive experts. So, Thanks. Uh, actually, related questions from uh, Mayank. What tools are usually used for in-house annotations, e.g., e for for example, for segmentation tasks? Are these high-quality tools or free tools or paid tools? Uh, how, uh, how, how do you recommend that, that to be done? Uh, so, well, uh, a lot of the time we rely on open source tools uh, to produce some annotations. Uh, there were a few uh, projects in the past where uh, we found those to be insufficient and we developed our own uh, proprietary tools uh, which we gave uh, the, the experts uh, and other annotation teams that help us with the task so yeah. you, most of the time we rely on the uh, open source or available tools and uh, when needed we develop uh, what's needed yeah it depends on how straightforward it is uh, in general the the tasks that are uh, sort of harder for laymen to understand, uh, we we find require uh, uh, in-house development of algorithms to make that annotation itself more efficient. Uh, question for Alex, uh, from Alex, uh, for model failure analysis, is there a rule of thumb for how much to augment a training set? So for, for example, if we build an initial model with 10,000 tra training images, uh, and then we find 10,000 more, where that initial model was wrong. Is it wise to j double the training set with hard examples? So again, how how to deal with, uh, what, what's the rule of thumb for adding artificial examples uh, versus keeping the original balance in the data set? Any uh, thoughts? So, uh, yeah, uh, I would think that at that point in the project, uh, I would ask myself how complicated the data is in itself. Because 10,000 images can be uh, quite simple, uh, quite quite a lot, if you just want to understand simple things. But they would be main, maybe uh, insufficient for uh, com for complex things like, like I don't know post, post estimation. Uh, so uh, first, I would need to understand that. And if I uh, would determine that 10,000 images are enough, and maybe we ha I have some other problem, then I try to understand where the algorithm fails. Uh, maybe I'll see that if the for if we can go back to the example with the teeth, maybe we, I had ten thousand images of teeth, but most of them were uh, of full sets of teeth, and I might want to add that specific augmentation which drops out some of them. So uh, in general, I would just look at where the algorithm fails and try to understand if I can perform some augmentation to resolve it. Uh, but adding uh, organic and uh, Data training data almost always is beneficial. It's just sometimes unavailable or expensive. So oh, really? again, see if uh, see if you can understand where the algorithm fails and if you can solve it with some augmentation. Uh, and if not, maybe try harder to get some more images. So so basically, measure the, it's sort of proportional to the to the amount of understandable failures. If you've got significant amount of understandable failures, that's what you're, you're gonna maybe want to try to reproduce those artificially in, in order to improve them. Uh, 
if you, you see that those are rarer than what you can get in the real data. Uh, another follow-up question on that, uh, this is an interesting one actually. What happens if there's no majority agreement, right? So, so right, as, as, we, as we said, as you said, Yigal, uh, when, when you know, things are more ambiguous, then you do a majority vote and get more than one expert. So uh, what, what happens if there's no majority agreement and what happens if the easy examples have majority vote but the hard ones uh, don't. So what, what do we do in that case? So uh, I'll reiterate, uh, I'll remind you that uh, neural networks are based on the biological vision system. So if we take a few, a few experts and they disagree about specific images, then that means that these images are actually hard to uh, classify even for experts. So. Uh, at this point, I would uh, try to not to get 100% uh, accuracy, but try to, to get the network to agree with uh, at least some of the experts. Uh, for instance, in uh, brain tumor segmentation, when you don't, when you don't uh, delineate the tumors uh, easily, when the experts don't do that, uh, maybe it's enough for the network to just agree with some of the experts. Then it, uh, you can say that the network is good as some experts, which uh, try to do more than that, uh, it should not be an interesting task to achieve. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that, that sounds like th this kind of case in which some subset of the images don't have any, uh, don't have enough uh, expert agreement, uh, then th this, this could be, uh, this could be an issue of, of the, the definition of the task itself. So you may want to, revisit why uh, one of your uh, uh, domain experts is saying X and the other one is saying uh, Y uh, consistently. Uh, it, it could be a matter of, of uh, re reformulating the definition of the task or, or, or uh, getting, getting alignment on, on how these images uh, should be marked and what the ground truth uh, really is. Uh, because otherwise, yeah, we're stuck with either with a noisy system because we've got noisy ground truth or with a system uh, that's modeling, say, uh, Egal's opinion rather than my opinion, or or something like that. So it it might be a difficulty issue, but it might be actually an issue of of how we've uh, how we've defined our uh, criteria for ground truth. Uh, interesting question here from Amir Khalili. So how how do you define minimum viable product before actual development in the early iterations of software uh, development cycle? Yeah, so I, I, I'd like to uh, chime in on that one. So how do we define minimum viable product? Uh, so th this, this is going to depend on, on the business situation, I think, right? So in some cases, uh, if, if, uh, if the business case is this is a startup trying to uh, create proof of concept and show it to outside stakeholders, uh, then uh, it might be one thing. Uh, if, uh, if this is a, a different situation, uh, then we may might actually need a system that's working uh, end to end that's actually performing. Uh, maybe we will go ahead and do uh, some initial integration phase. We'll, we'll create uh, the pieces of software around the AI module that are needed in order to use it, in order to test it in the lab. Uh, so the minimal viable product in that case might not just be something that you can demo, but something that you can actually use, uh, say in a lab or say in a, a industrial test bed. Uh, maybe the accuracy is still not going to be uh, as high as you would need it uh, uh, for the actual uh, uh, production requirements, but still you're able to show that this is functioning uh, in its real uh, situation or in reasonable approximation of the real situation in which it's going to be used. Uh, and then you've got, uh, again, you've got a prototype, you've shown that this can work, uh, and then you can make the case for scaling up the data set, say, uh, to keep uh, uh, bringing up uh, the accuracy. So uh, sometimes uh, this involves sort of uh, doing some of the more integration type uh, things before you've actually reached uh, production level performance in order to close the loop uh, and to uh, demonstrate the case for uh, acquiring the additional data needed uh, for accuracy. Uh, let's see, we've got about a couple minutes left. Uh, so I think we'll have time uh, to take one or two additional questions. Uh, let me see. Hang on. 
Okay, yeah, th this this sort of goes back to thing that we've uh, uh, discussed, but uh, I think it's a very interesting question. What is your perspective on leveraging synthetic data for training versus just using real annotated images? Uh, what, what's what's uh, our perspective on this? So I can say that, uh, and Eagle has also said this, that uh, real images are always better. Uh, the more uh, 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 real-life data you get, the better off you're going to be. Uh, however, uh, in many cases, uh, the performance and the, the success of an algorithm is not only measured uh, statistically, if you're doing 98% uh, success or 99% success or whatever, but it's also uh, going to be measured on very specific uh, cases or edge cases that can be very rare. So just collecting more uh, real-world data is not always going to be a solution in order to deal with those edge cases. They might be very rare, but the cost uh, in terms of the use case of failing on those cases might be quite high. Uh, and in that type of situation, uh, since our resources and data collection are, are, are not infinite, uh, we, uh, in many cases, will we'll have no choice but to generate uh, those artificial examples. Uh, I don't know, Yigal, uh, anything uh, else you want to add on that, synthetic versus real data? Um, I think you summed it up uh, pretty well. I agree with every word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another question that sometimes the idea pops up to train a model to synthesize artificial data. Yeah, do you have any positive experiences about this? So so this this is a, a really one of the a, a, a newer developments in AI, right? Synthesizing data, it's called domain adaptation. Uh, so many of you have probably seen uh, even uh, uh, websites in which you can upload an image of your face and it's going to draw it in the style of Van Gogh or, or uh, Picasso or whatever. And uh, actually, we're uh, seeing this technology of domain adaptation and style transfer uh, starting to be used in more uh, uh, sort of real world uh, type of applications. Uh, at, at, this, at this stage, uh, today's sort of uh, 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 ripeness of this technology, I would say uh, you do probably don't want to take the risk of, of training a solution uh, entirely uh, using this kind of synthetic data. Uh, but uh, in some cases, uh, do uh, it is beneficial to make use of this uh, technology. So uh, it's, not going to, it's not going to eliminate the need for uh, collecting real world data. You're always going to need real examples. Uh, but sometimes you can use uh, style transfer technology. Uh, say you have real examples, but some piece of ground truth is missing from those examples, or some part of the problem is not solvable based on the real examples. It's only solvable on artificial examples. Uh, so what you can do is use uh, domain adaptation or style transfer uh, to sort of convert those real examples to the artificial examples uh, that are needed uh and uh and that and that way uh get around that uh, limitation I, I can give you actually a, a very specific example about that so uh we have uh, uh developed pretty recently a solution for 3d reconstruction of uh, bones uh for orthopedic applications from two x-rays so you get two x-rays as an input from uh 90 degree angles and the output of the neural network is a 3d model uh of the bone uh, this problem has been uh, explored in the past with classical computer vision methods, but has various limitations and it's not uh, all that robust. And uh, we, we've got actually a, a white paper that's uh, uh, in the process of peer review that's going to uh, come out about how we've uh, tackled this problem using neural networks. Uh, now, uh, the input is two x-rays, the output is a 3D model of the bones. There are uh, very few data sets, uh, very few ways of getting this kind of ground truth data. Uh, it's very hard to get two x-rays of a patient and also to get a CT of the same patient. That kind of data is uh, relatively rare. Uh, and the way uh, uh, we got around this is by doing domain adaptation. So it's relatively easy to get these x-rays. It's relatively easy to get CTs of other people where you know the 3D shape of the bone. Uh, we can train a neural network using artificial uh, x-rays generated from those CTs to do 3D reconstruction. And then we can put in the other piece of the puzzle of making uh, the, making it work on x-rays as well, uh, using uh, these newer uh, other deep learning technologies of style transfer. Uh, so I hope that was clear. That's sort of, sort of an example of how uh, you can use artificially generated data as one piece of the puzzle, uh, but it's not going to eliminate the need 
for, for the real uh, data. You still need your real x-rays, but those don't necessarily have to be paired uh, with the ground truth of the actual uh, uh, 3D patient anatomy. You can uh, uh, get rid of the need uh, for some aspects of the uh, real world data. Okay, uh, thank you very much everybody and thanks for the great feedback we're seeing here as well. Uh, we will uh, continue to uh, keep you up to date of, uh, about uh, future webinars and uh, please feel free to drop us a line and uh, contact us with any further questions. Uh, this uh, video of this webinar will be uh, published online in probably a day or two at most. Uh, so you can uh, share it with uh, whatever other colleagues or friends that you may have who might be interested in seeing it. Uh, really appreciate uh, the participation and the questions uh, and uh, everybody who's joined us today. Uh, and have a good uh, rest of your afternoon or evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Egan.